right, special Thursday night edition of Jazz Cabbage Cafe. Uh, we've kind of covered this uh, Viridis lab scandal issue pretty thoroughly since it's been going on, including another special edition show when the recall took place and just the enormity of uh, that and uh, thought that we needed to talk about that. And this is a major development. There's been an update. There's been a new complaint file or an updated complaint filed by the state. I'll turn it over to Rick to kind of give some details in a second. We should be joined hopefully by attorney Paul to Linda in a little bit and, and from uh, back from uh, PSI labs, Lave, um, and, uh, and get some insight there. I did ask some other uh, labs, a few of them, and uh, there's some, there's some pressure. There's some perceived, uh, liability out there if you come on and say the wrong thing i guess so uh, it's a real concern for a lot of labs so i got a couple of anonymous statements from from labs and and one you know with the name on it which is just a nice quote you know and so i'll, I'll read those when uh when we get a little bit further into it and uh, uh so and i also want to say that viridis we're going to rag on them Probably a lot of us don't like them and are, are, are aware of a history that we can talk about. I think, though, just sticking to opinions, facts, what's known publicly, um, it's, it kind of speaks for itself, in my opinion. But um, they contend they haven't done anything wrong. I mean, they, they keep on challenging this. They, they fight against it. There's nobody here representing them. They, uh, they probably do not agree with us. You know, I just want to point out they have a different perspective on all of this or seemingly say that they do. And. And they uh, um, they have processes to go through to try to challenge you know these things and in some cases they haven't responded when they were supposed to but maybe they think that there's another um, avenue we'll have to discuss that too but I just want to make sure that's kind of disclaimed a little bit because uh, um, I know I don't necessarily uh, have much positive to say you know and before this lab scandal ever took place I, I felt this way so. We might get into some of that a, a little bit, but I do want to uh, let people know if they want to know their their perspective. Uh, it's out there, and it's probably not exactly what you know everything that we might discuss. So uh, let me just turn this over to Rick to give a little background and let us know about the more recent uh, development that we're going to be discussing tonight. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie. So uh, if you've been following along with shows like Jazz Cabbage Cafe, Smoking Rope, Chad Watch, if you've been following any of those. You've heard us talk about the issue with the Viridis lab scandal. Just in brief, in 2019, Viridis, uh, a testing lab, was licensed by the state of Michigan to test both medical and adult use flour. Viridis was founded by a former uh, head of the Michigan State Police Crime Laboratory, who during his tenure at the Michigan State Police Crime Laboratory had some uh, very nasty things that he did and, and got caught doing, uh, working with prosecutors to fix uh uh, definitions of cannabis substances in order to make it easier to charge people and not necessarily reflecting the, two science, the true science of the moment. So Veritas launched in 2019 and almost immediately they were in trouble with the MRA. In 2020, they came under the MRA's radar and was cited for a minor offense. 2021 is when things really took off. Uh, there were numerous complaints uh, uh, regarding Veritas's uh, methodology in 2021, the, the MRA started to, uh, back then the MRA, which is now the CRA. So I'm going to use those terms simultaneously. Uh, and they, you should understand that we're referring to the same department. It just has different titles at different times in the story. So the Marijuana Regulatory Agency at that time uh, did some on-site inspections, found some stuff they thought was pretty heinous. Uh, and then they aggregated all of their concerns together into a suit, which they filed against Viridis. Um, it's a formal complaint, which is which is crafted in a lawsuit style uh, document, which is why I continue to refer to it as a lawsuit, even though it's probably just a, an internal complaint document. Ryan Basor is now uh, uh, posting uh, an additional link for some additional info. If you, uh, if you don't uh, get all the information you need during this show, you can certainly look it up and check it out. This would be the story of issues with these guys from before the, uh, their, their participation in the Canvas Lab. Yep, cannabis crime lab Industry. frame. Absolutely yeah. true, and that, that's that's uh, that thing we talked about with the Michigan State Police Crime Lab. So in 2021, uh, the Marijuana Regulatory Agency slapped a big penalty on these guys, uh, both for the Lansing Laboratory and for their 
Bay City Laboratory. Uh, Viridus took them to court saying that it didn't think it should be responsible for any of the huge nation leading industry's largest recall ever. The court agreed 50% with Viridus and 50% with the MRA. They recognize that the MRA has the right to, to challenge and punish companies that step outside the bounds, but that they only had evidence suggesting Lansing was the cause of the problem, not that Bay City was. So any of the product produced by the Bay City Laboratory or approved rather by the Bay City Laboratory was exempted by the judge from that lawsuit. Viridus took that 50% win and ran with it as if it was a total exoneration of all of the concerns about them. And just to clarify, Rick, uh, the, the state was was running off of the concept that the same processes were being used at both places. So they, you know, they were thinking, okay, we have to we have to we have to address both of these places because the same cause is is taking place at each of them. But go ahead. And and you're absolutely right. And one of the reasons they thought that the same things were happening in both places is because the standard operating procedures, you're going to hear us refer to SOPs oftentimes during this broadcast, uh, and that's standard operating procedures. If the standard operating procedures are exactly the same for both companies and the standard operating procedures are flawed or incorrect, logically, it makes sense that both companies then have been using that procedure and have created poor results. In any event, Viridus has continued to move forward doing all of the same things that they, at least it seems that they have, move forward doing all the same things they did prior to their original suit in 2021 using their enhanced THC potency method, which is called the Viridus method, which is not approved for use by the Marijuana Regulatory Agency and no other lab in Michigan uses. Their uh, absolute refusal to, to fail any cannabis sample for contaminants since their initial and their initial award of the license in 2019. Never once, never once bad contaminants in your lab. That's bullshit. And the fact that the Cannabis Regulatory Agency now released information we just got that shows that the level of, of discovery of aspergillus is extremely low in their lab as compared to other laboratories too. Now that together as a threesome means that they have elevated THC values. They're not stopping things coming out with, uh, with contaminants in it and that they're under-reporting, potentially under-reporting microbial contamination, which could be a significant health concern for people. So there's a lot of reasons why we in the cannabis industry are extremely concerned on behalf of consumers for the Viridus' success. Now, underscoring all of this is the fact that those elevated THC numbers have given Viridus an unfair market advantage over all the other testing labs in the state. At one point, Viridus' own people said they figured they tested about 60% of all of the $2 billion in cannabis that sold in, in Michigan. So at this particular point, any little problem with a lab that big becomes a huge issue for the people of the state of Michigan. Right. So now we're at a point where the Cannabis Regulatory Agency has included, has discovered new information. So they updated their original complaint, which dated from 2021, updated it in 2022, including some additional charges, uh, some additional issues that they raised, and a, a deadline, a deadline for, for compliance or response. Now, that deadline for compliance or response is already eclipsed, and uh, it's more than 21 days past that deadline, which is the number that they have in order, that's, that's the time period they're given in order to appeal any kind of a potential penalty or sanction situation. So we certainly see that, uh, uh, fuck you, George. So that's, uh, uh, we certainly see that Viridus Labs has uh, <clears throat> continued to do the things they were told were wrong. <coughs> and they've continued to do that even though there's been public relations campaigns, cannabis regulatory agency sanctions, and, uh, and other people from the industry speaking out against them. So that's my summary for where we're sitting right now. This new lawsuit or this updated lawsuit really seems like it's got some teeth. And it also seems as if we might get some some results of that coming up here in short order. So that's awesome, man. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, let's go over who's here. And then I got an immediate question based on that uh, summary. Um, we have, of course, Rick just gave that great uh, presentation to bring people up to snuff with where we are right now, why we've covered this so much. Uh, we have Kyle Miller joining us here tonight with What's Easton up? Craft, Redemption Cannabis, and Chad Watch, which is a great podcast that watches 
the Chads of the industry. His co-host Chris Silva, with also with Reduction Cannabis, and lots been involved with lots of stuff over the years. As has Kyle. We have Anton Harb Jr. with us. Uh, veteran representation, a few different organizations, but uh, on our regular show. And Lave has come back. He was on our last show before we knew this development was going to happen. And um, uh, you know, Lave, there's other uh, labs that are concerned about coming on and talking about this stuff. And I think you've you've kept things to your opinion on stuff, stating facts. As, you know, as, as can be demonstrated by the data and then them talking about what else is publicly known. I, I don't see how you run into much issue if you keep it there, but I think some places are concerned they'll go too far down some road and, um, you know, leave themselves liable. So I appreciate you being here. It's probably just a good idea to remember that. Uh, oh, yeah, obviously got to be careful what you say. I mean, this is an ongoing uh, active court case, so. Yeah, man. So thanks very much. But I, but uh, the, I guess the question I had, they've been, the Beardus has been so defensive and has challenged these things. And the reason that, you know, the, the judge had to make these considerations and take these arguments, you know, um, into consideration for his decision was because they really, they brought in some high power to, you know, attorneys and made some, you know, arguments that had to be addressed and they, they they just really did what they could do to challenge this stuff so in this case they let the 21 days lapse i mean are they just accepting this now or are they, they going to challenge it from another angle they, they they probably has already responded but that wouldn't have been something that would be noted in the uh, in the court documents that would just be an yeah. internal thing that probably we don't have access to yet and i'm sorry Levi, i didn't mean to jump oh, no. in. yeah that would be my guess you know that there's ongoing conversations with them uh, in CRA at this time. Yeah. No, I mean, it's just, you know, but it, it was definitely um, revealing information, I think, about some of what's been going on and, you know, the challenges that they're uh, pushing back with the state on. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it's just important for labs to run approved methods, uh, obviously, for the, the liability for their clients and for the safety of the consumers. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. So the safety of the consumers is really what drives most of us here. I mean, we may be unhappy with Greg Michaud for uh, for the work that he did at the Michigan State Police, but the reality is people are are potentially put in danger by some of the misdeeds that are going on right now. Um, well, even even if not, even if you want to say, look, there's you know, we say all the time, you know, none of this cannabis has ever caused any issue that we can really point to or whatever, and you know, and and even if there's not like a in imminent danger. I mean, there very well could be because somebody who has one of these these rare sensitivities could come across thinking that the, that the the joint that was supposed to have met all the standards before making it to the retail store didn't, and they, you know, took it thinking it did and had some uh, had an adverse you know reaction. So I'm not saying like it can't happen, but regardless of any of that, if, you know, the uh, uh, the consumer should get what they are expecting. And they should be told what the product is that they're buying, you know, and that and those things haven't matched up in some cases. Yeah. And I mean, For in sure. terms of potency and potency inflation, you know, I mean, it's a pretty clear issue, right? If what people are buying a lot of the times is potency. And so if that's not being uh, authentically represented, then, you know, I, I see that as a big issue for the consumers. Well, it's something it was originally intended that to be a skewing the market. Exactly. It's skewing the market on THC. It's, it's... Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's gotten to where I'll have clients say to me, "Oh, you know, I, dispensaries won't take my product if it's not twenty five percent THC," and that's the ninety third percentile in my lab. So it's like you're rejecting ninety three percent of the the cannabis that's available to you. You know, or are you seeing maybe a higher percentage uh, of product above that number? Now, where I come to my conclusions about, you know, how do we know what's an accurate number and how do we know sort of the distribution? Well, it's because, you know, scientists just published a paper involving nearly 100,000 data points from six unrelated labs in six states uh, that the data passes the statistical sniff test in the sense that when you look at these data sets, they represent what would be a normal distribution that you would see 
in a natural product that has natural variability, right? Whereas if you look at certain labs, uh, distribution of their potencies they've tested, there are clear statistical anomalies um, up on the high end there. You know, and it's, I think it's really obvious why they would do that. And Chris Silva uh, hit right on the point, and that's that you would want to skew THC numbers higher in order to create greater marketability for your product. Uh, you know, Chris, you've been in the industry for quite some time. Kyle with Eastern Craft Cannabis, too. You guys have, have been around. You know that it's just absolutely abnormal to see something with 36, 38, 40 percent THC. That just doesn't represent what we've known in the industry to be the case in the past. No, it doesn't at all. And uh, I remember over a year ago, year and a half ago, seeing 30 for the first time. And uh, I don't I don't recall who the lab was the first time I had seen it. But since that time, 30 has kind of been the benchmark. I mean, 31 sometimes from people I know that are trusted. But um, this 40 and beyond is uh, it's unrealistic. And I don't think there's any science that can back it up. Um, we obviously all saw the sample that Justin Palmentier took to spot labs showed a super inconsistent result. And I think if you took that same sample or other samples from that batch to other labs across the state, it would be more identical to what their results were. I will, by the way, I will just say for anyone that wants to look at that Justin Palmatier thing, High Times Magazine wrote about that, and I'm going to share the link in the comments right now. Uh, so you can see the details of the two different tests that were performed. Chris, I know you want to get in on this. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I just think that it's, it's, it's absolutely insane what it's doing in the market. It's reinforcing like the THC bullshit with all the customers, right? Like the people walking into Loom think that they're getting high on 41% THC and stuff. So like it... And, and then everything builds on that, right? So it, it, it messes up for the market for everybody, the consumer, like the retail. Um, this There needs to be, a, I'm, I'm hoping Viridis like loses their license or something. There needs to be like a reset on on the THC stuff, you know, like this, it's getting like, it's getting to a point where it's <clears throat> it's really out of hand and so on, like so unbelievable so, too. Like, So here it is right here, Chris, what you're saying is right. Lave made a comment about that in the paper and on our show in the M live recently and on our show about how the, uh, the stores feed right into the market demand as opposed to trying to do things. And, and I will say in a lot of stores defense, cause I've seen it, it people try it. By the way, we've been joined by uh, Trisha, Trish Matson. So thanks for coming on with us. Uh, it just, it's really difficult when you're, when you're poised and you're ready to try to have these conversations but everybody comes in and speaks in terms of THC percentage, sativa, indica, these things that like aren't necessarily useful in predicting effect or trying to choose medicine for people, but that have just become so internalized in the, you know, in the just, discussion. You know, another interesting finding of that paper that our data was part of um, just came out in PLOS One was that sativa, indica is essentially meaningless, you know, especially at this point. Um, it does nothing when you try and group things that way. It's a scatter plot. You don't see any grouping that shows, oh, these, uh, you know, once you plot actual principal chemical components in these things. So there's what we call, it's largely a fiction we've created that's based on how something looks and the historical um, kind of, uh, you know, just history of what people claim this thing was about. But the reality is if you plot things in terms of their predominant terpene profiles, and uh, sort of cannabinoid ranges, you get a much more interesting breakdown that shows there are groupings um, of kind of related, you know, strains that that will have similar tastes, similar effects. So to me, that's where this needs to go. Like if I went out right now and were to drink an IPA, right? I mean, I don't know exactly what it's going to taste like, but I know what it's going to taste like, and it's going to taste more similar to other IPAs relative to say a, a stout or a porter or something right there's there's rules and codes that we have that define how we actually uh describe and experience these products and i think for cannabis that's been kind of just arbitrary you know in, in a right. lot of sometimes um there's some real stuff and there are real strains and there's you know dubious claims where people say something's a strain that it's not but um yeah i think you know that's the really exciting part about collecting all this kind of data is seeing that it's not just like hey who has the strongest uh or let's let's call it the highest thc weed i mean strength is 
a little more subjective, right, in terms of how it actually hits you. Uh, but I think if we move this conversation to what you know, what are we appreciating about this strain? It's high or low THC might be desirable. Um, you know, taste and smells. So uh, some of the guys who wrote this article, I think, did a great job comparing this to kind of dogs, right? So like like cannabis, dogs are all one species essentially, right? That's um, just interbred. Uh, kind of phenotypes from some ancestor that was a wolf, right? And so, uh, big, you know, Great Dane is a big dog. Chihuahua is a little dog. Uh, we haven't yet found a way to breed a dog that looks and acts like a Chihuahua, but is as large as a Great Dane. And so, sitting here calling a strain of uh, cannabis like, say, Tropicana Cookies that you know tends to max out at eighteen percent, and saying, oh, it's twenty nine, it's thirty two. It's like this Chihuahua is not a great name, you know, and it's, it's pretty obvious when you look at it and it doesn't need to be. They're both great, you know, and so that's just sort of how and the like differences, it. of course, are way more than just the THC number. And that's oh. not an indication of how high somebody's going to get or how good the cannabis is. It's just something that we've identified as being a part of it and have really like put a lot of extra focus and emphasis on probably, um, you know, when we shouldn't. So, well, let me tell you this. That's a that's a Jurassic Park kind of a frightening monster you just described there. Can you imagine, you know, with a with a, a Chihuahua's little yippy biting yeah. kind of a always in your face type of an attitude in a great right. name size? Let's yeah. be glad that combo doesn't exist. But exactly. but your your point is of course well taken. One thing to remember, let me just blow your mind for a second here. Uh Grown In is a, a wonderful magazine that predicts or uh, that uh put out a couple of articles just recently uh, and one of them talks about the number of cannabis plants under under cultivation in, in Michigan last year this time 403,000 this year this time 1.125 million so more than doubling the number of plants under lights within the space of a year now what does that do that creates a huge incentive to cheat right because if, if you can get even a little bit more marketability for that million plants, right? Even a little bit more money for those million plants, you could really you could really bust a bank. So you can see where there's a, a, a clear pathway to advantage for one company or another to use just the, can, the the testing facility that delivers these extraordinarily high results, especially in a marketplace that has really doubled its competitiveness within the last 12 months. So, uh, you know, earlier, oh, go ahead, Anton, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you know, I was going to say, I'll, I'll come in with a couple of thoughts here too, you know, and I've always said this is according to, you know, Nate Darling calls me, I'm the veteran weed guy, right? I'm just a, a fucking dude that hangs out and appreciates the industry. I'm a disabled veteran who suffers on a daily basis and cannabis is my medicine. That's, that's what allows me the quality of life that I live. Right. And when I look at this scenario, what pisses me off about this is we, we are, from my opinion, we're, we're preying on ignorance because we have an immature market. People may just be getting into cannabis. They're just they're not aware. But it appears some have decided to prey upon this and capitalize on this, whether it be for market share, whether it be out of ego, because uh, I'm not hearing anybody saying, hey, let's let's come to the table and figure out why these results are, are, are happening. Right. I just hear, hey, our methods are top notch and, and we're defying science. Deal with it. Right. And we're being picked on. And to me, is the consumer, the guy who's going out there purchasing the redemption products, purchasing the good who does their research and who is informed in what's going on. I see information and I see my regulators, the head regulator in the state of Michigan, who is putting out information that is deeply, highly disturbing to the point to where I feel anxious about this. As a consumer who depends on cannabis, it makes me feel anxious, right? And I'm scared, uh, scared, uh, not in a fearful way, but scared that we are willing to accept this as not only an industry, but as a state and as voters who voted for this, right? I want to get to the bottom of it. If they're growing 50% cannabinoid flower, cool, let's prove it. They should be commended if that's the case, right? But science doesn't currently 
support that. And when I say science, I mean our regulators, our scientists, our labs, other growers, our provisioning centers. Nobody supports this. So where is this coming from and why is it being allowed to happen? That's my perspective. And is it is it just fear of lawsuit? Because the last time they kind of got their butt kicked a little bit in, in court, which it could very well be. Tricia, I know you just joined us and I want to get you involved in the conversation. As a cannabis consumer, you're a person who's more knowledgeable than the average person out there. You know about terpenes. You know about flavonoids. You know how to properly buy. Uh, hello, Marie. You know how to properly buy cannabis. Uh, this THC fluctuation stuff, does that really does that really mess with your world in the market perspective? <clears throat> well, it's funny. I had just seen a recent person, I, and I don't remember the person's name, uh, had posted something about doing their endocannabinoid test. And I forgot that I had done my own too as well. And uh, I looked into it and, and it says particularly that um, I am a uh, uh, detective, highly detective of anxiety, PTSD, um, opiate, um, like basically I, I could basically have the genetic code to uh, be addicted to opioids. I think they would never get that path. But um, just knowing like a little bit about how uh, the science that it, that is available to us now kind of determines that helps me decide what it is that I want in my body. Absolutely, I want to know what's in there. But um, an another thing that I was thinking about as everybody was talking about this is that not only is testing important for the THC, but let's talk about on a medicinal level, especially when it comes to testing. We're living in a world right now where half the country or half the world lost their taste and smell too as well. And like having promethia is something that a lot of people don't understand is kind of like a, a thing, but it is a thing. And I've been talking to a lot of growers and about this too as well. So I want to also not just like, it makes me sad that our testing is like going towards the alcohol like frame of mind. And I, what I say about that is like same thing with alcohol. Everybody that wanted to drink to get drunk just went higher and, and like we should not be regulating towards letting it be as big as it is. We should be regulating towards about the joy of what it could be or how it could be just, um, I guess better if I would say. But long story short, um, if, if we can actually gain trust in, you know, our labs and our testing, uh, then it can start helping other people in different ways. So it's just sad because we're so far behind, but yet like for me as a patient and somebody who is starting to like put in the effort to figure out what is the most benefit to me instead of having it around and just like whatever it is since I was like 16 years old, I guess. Um, you know, it, it just, it's disappointing. Uh, I don't think that uh, THC levels should matter. Uh, it is something that is directing it towards alcohol. And of course, that is not something we're against, uh, but 100% taking away from the medicinal value of the, the product. And I feel like in my heart, a lot of times you'll get, if you're going to use it on a recreational level, uh, the terpenes are very important and that THC is not going to take the place without the terpene being in there in the first place. Uh, and the same thing on a medicinal level. So basically everybody is different, but THC should not be, I feel like the benefactor of buying weed and, and cannabis. And so far they're creating that mindset within the consumer process and it's just going to destroy any other benefit that's moving forward with it as well. Yeah. Let's emphasize showing a lot more information in terms of what's inside the plant for people to have when mm -hmm. they're, when they're determining what's working for them or, or maybe why, or what they prefer or, or anything like that. And then make sure that there's no pesticides and, and let people know if there's lots of mold or whatever on it. And, you know, and, uh, you know, be able to have it screened in that way. But Michigan certainly, I yeah. think we can argue, is 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 more THC focused than other states, and I think it's because of these inflated THC numbers provided by a specific lab that that helps that tries to differentiate cannabis from one person to another. That's helped to perpetuate that, made it a bigger problem when stores even try to like 
sure. be prepared to have those conversations and accelerated it. I mean, so we yeah. maybe we may have had three years of corruption in two years. Who knows? I mean, it's difficult to gauge that, but I certainly feel like the race to to the top and THC levels has been certainly assisted by a lab that's willing to to flip THC levels as as high as they need to go. Leave you you talked about this study with thousands and thousands of data points. There was nobody forty percent THC cannabis in that study, right? No. So when you look at that out of the, you know, 90,000 that we ran, like I said, so in our lab, and it's pretty comparable in that broader data set, um, you know, anything over 30 is three out of a thousand samples, right, that we've tested. And it's it's not random. It's not like, wow, this guy is great. Everything he grows is 30%. You know, I'm going to harp on that um, genetic diversity component again, right? Like in my top 10 are things like Jenny Kush, uh, all these Kushes, um, mint, you know, Kush mints, um, GMO, things with chem dog. So there are some families of strains that are particular genetic lineages that are known for high THC content, you know, and um, that's great. And and so those are kind of the, the big THC producers, but there's plenty of other good strains, you know, I think emphasis on, on that was good, right? In the alcohol world, not to, to go back to this, I know this is a played out metaphor, everyone knows it, but like good alcohol doesn't equal strong alcohol, right? I mean, you can drink more. You can, you know, there's there's ways around it if your intention is to consume a higher amount. Um, most people at this point have put the, the active ingredient sort of in the back seat to the flavor, the experience, you know, and, and that's like, to me, good cannabis is stuff that tastes good and smells good and is like enjoy it burns well and it's enjoyable to smoke it hits smooth you know there's a lot more to it than um oh i read the label and it said it's super potent and, and it might be but if it's not grown well and you know it's not cured well and it's not um, a quality product you're, you're not going to go there and you know again it's just you could pay thousands of dollars for a bottle of wine that's based on the quality of the grapes it has no more alcohol in it than uh, a buck chuck or um it has less alcohol in it by far than you know Everclear or whatever but thc doesn't behave the, the, the same just based on its composition you know in the plant it's also how it interacts synergistically with all the other components yeah, and then how the individual system accepts it that's why that number doesn't really gauge how high somebody gets or you know any other like really yeah really, you know i got a You're couple right. of it does oh, sorry, but go ahead. Said that, that uh, uh, but people need a, a, an easy guide. They need something simple, right? Proof is a super easy guide to determine how strong booze is, right? Yeah, you know, three percent beer or six percent beer, totally different, right? Well, the fact is, people try to treat THC percentage as if it's proof, and it is not. And Jamie right. always complains when people ter- use the term potency to describe THC percentage. I, I've, talked to lab- I've talked to I've talked to Lave about that. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'm joined by attorney Paul Talenda too, by the it, way. It's, su- it's such common. Yeah, we, we are. I want to get kind of caught up on something and, and then talk to Paul. So earlier, John Bronson uh, brought up and something that we have discussed before that perhaps universal um, standards would be good in, in testing, at least in the whole state, you know, so that anything compared against each other uh, will have the background of having gone through whatever that standard, you know, utilizing whatever that standard is. Do you agree with that, Leif? I mean, it's, you know, standards and labs, it's more complicated than people give it credit for, I think, to be honest. Um, And things like these ISO accreditations, the standards that we have, I mean, they do a great job at at getting kind of like a base level, you know, saying, hey, here we are, we walked in, um, this is an actual lab, they have equipment that can do science, you know, that's important. You'd be amazed at what people will try and do out there in the world, right? Say they're doing a test and they may not even have the equipment to do that test. So this is a very basic level that they're looking at. Um, They don't know anything about what are accurate THC numbers, right? So that's not something they're even looking at when they come in and check out the labs. So sort of saying you're accredited, you have procedures and you follow those procedures and you document issues, you know? And so, well, and, and, and if you're if you're proven not to have followed those procedures, then you're following in non-compliance. Then, yeah, absolutely. And and as a lab, it's your duty to look out for those things, document when you do accidentally or whatever. You know, for whatever reason, you are non-compliant, non-conformant to your own policies. Um, 
any of that stuff, you know, that needs to be documented and written up. It's part of our quality management system, which in, means that you're always working on that and trying to improve and trying to learn from mistakes and not make them again. And, you know, um, judging the risk of each of those mistakes, right. In terms of what its impact is on your business, your client's business, the people who are ultimately, um, you know, using these products, right. The, all that stuff goes into what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and how we handle our, our methodologies. But it's just not as simple as people say it is, but that's where, you know, for me, I don't like to lean heavily on this concept of, well, we have to know exactly how someone's doing something to be able to say that they're doing it and prove it and whatever. I'm a scientist. So uh, you look at the data, the data shows you what you need to see. Um, I have a, a, you know, by my training and by my nature, uh, a desire to put out accurate information. It's I'm an, a science background from academia. Um, there, the whole goal is to produce some data that could be reproduced by someone else and tell them exactly how to do it. That's how you gain, um, you know, uh, that's how you move up in academia, right? Is by making your case, showing good data, proving that it's legitimate and that it stands the test of. As, as Loom did when they were explaining why they had 45% THC, as Ryan was reminding us. Yeah, I'd love to see more tests. You know, those, those percentages were accurate. Yeah, I mean, according the to the fact, that, fact. Yeah. State of the art cultivation, unrivaled <laughs> environmental control. They have a better environment no, than the environment. Be, Jenny Cush is amazingly um, high THC cannabis. I'll say that. It absolutely is. Um, that's 100%. So that, means, so that means there's less of other stuff. It, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it doesn't, you know, again, it doesn't Maybe mean that is what you need or whatever. No, the best or whatever. It's, yeah. but I think it's good. I like it. You know, I'm not, no, I'm, no, I'm sure. I'm not, not, there's a lot of high THC cannabis yeah. that is really good, but it's not necessarily because you know, Absolutely. There's, there's a large, you know, composition of THC in it. Yeah. And of course, before, we, before we jump to, uh, to talking to Paul, and I apologize. I just want to call to attention uh, the stellar list of people we have in our chat room right now. We've got uh, Ryan Basor, you know, a captain of the industry, nationally known guy. We've got uh, folks from from Michigan Labs in there. Uh, Brandy Zink from Americans for Safe Access. If you look on on the screen right now of the uh, eight of us, I think there's like five or six different shows that go on each week in Michigan, represented here by hosts. Uh, whether it's FOB or whether it's Medical Mondays or, or you know, uh, 420 posts, we got a lot of folks here and in the the chat room is full of some some of the real knowledgeable people in the state. So I appreciate folks that tuned in to check this broadcast out. I know we want to give Paul a moment, but go yeah. ahead. No, you're good. I mean, I'm, yeah, I just, uh, as far as standards go, it's, uh, you know, I think because we're in such an infancy stage in this industry, there really is a due diligence of people doing this science to go above and beyond and ensure that they are accurate, you know? And, and I would just say this about, if there's extraordinary claims out there about potencies, um, you know, show us how you do it, right? Like good science is about saying, here's what I did. It's transparent. You can replicate it if you want, go ahead and do it. So if, the, if there really is a method that yields higher results for THC and it's valid, that needs to be demonstrated, you know, to, for these claims to be accepted, right? And if that's not the case, Science just says, you know, sorry, if nobody else agrees with your result, we're going to question your result. You know, that's how science works. So, yeah. So let's turn it over to Paul for a second. I appreciate that. Then we'll come back to some other stuff like uh, how the uh, ISO, the third party stuff is supposed to work. Because some people have been asking about that, too. Like why we're supposed to be able to rely on these numbers to some degree. And I know that there's a lot of latitude and you expect places to be ethical. And that is where there could be some some stuff, but let's talk about that in a minute. Cause I want to find out from some of the legal perspective and your, your thoughts on this, Paul, from whatever you'd like to say, but, you know, obviously from this updated complaint and what it means legally and, you know, and that type of stuff. Let me, I'll, I'll get to the complaint. Cause the biggest thing about the complaint is the timing of the issue. Uh, but let me get, let me kind of start and, and, and Lev mentioned a, a handful of each uh, of issues. Um, first off, I don't think, and I know we're not the only state to experience a, a potency issue or a testing issue. Illinois had an issue with their vape pens where I think you could ask for a certain number and you'd get it. Um, there are other problems with, uh, I think it was edibles in Colorado. 
uh, where certain, or maybe it was Nevada, where certain numbers were off so they can get them into the marketplace. Um, so I think the testing as the gatekeeper of what we think it is, is our safety or the quality or even the potency of it all. Um, again, I, I do support the idea of, of like some type of universal standard, which, you know, silly me and maybe silly industry, that's what we kind of thought the state gave us when they gave us the safety compliance facilities. And if they didn't, then this is also where I, I kind of go back to this complaint to me first off reads like the regulators got caught flat footed. And not only did they get caught flat footed when they regrouped, uh, no one had an answer. So they had to go somewhere else for it or they had to research it. They had to look for it because they, they, they couldn't respond immediately uh, in a certain fashion, um, even though they did in a certain regard. Um, the other one, Levy brought up the one thing that I, uh, I think is really important about the potency issue as, as regards to the whole industry, right? You talked about Everclear. And for me, Everclear is the perfect example because Everclear, if you think about where Everclear appeared in your lifetime, it was college parties, when you turned 21, when you were very young, when you were after this, chase the drunk, get the buzz. And in reality, like we talk about proof and we talk about potency was more gets you more wasted, right? So I don't have to drink as much Everclear to get to that same level. And that's the selling point of it. But that is, in essence, an oversimplification of alcohol in itself, as we've seen through the development of craft beers and the like. But it also appeals to, let's say, the, the entry level juvenile user, right? So that now that cannabis is legal and people who don't know anything about it are like, hey, I hear you can catch a buzz from this. What do I do? And it gets sold to you as saying, hey, the higher, the better. It's a juvenile oversimplification of what's really happening. And I think that that um, much like we aged out of Everclear into microbrews and the like, and I know I also hate the alcohol analogy too, but it's the closest one we have, unfortunately. Um, the industry will also get there. I mean, we're starting to see that out on the West Coast, and we're starting to see that um, at least in efforts out of the dispensaries to the degree that they work, right? Because a lot of people now know what they know and like what they like, and the ability to educate somebody freshly when they come to the door, I, I'd like to say that that number is always consistent because you're always getting some new consumers, but it really is on the point of purchase to educate the consumer, much like the way we buy diamonds or the way we buy appliances or the way we buy any other, let's say, important purchase. And even to a large degree, the same way you buy wine, you go to the wine store and you trust the guy. You're like, hey, my wife likes Pinots, pick them out. Okay, give me two, here you go. Um, the other part that I want that, that Love brought up is that <laughs> the SOP, the SOP, right? This is this is the important part that also goes back in, into into the Lara complaint is that the SOP for me is okay. An SOP is an internal document that says this is how I do things, which outside of a strictly analytical interpretation of that in in face of a violation, the SOP to me sounds like uh, let me do an internal investigation. Right. Let me take a look into it internally and we'll we will determine if we violate our own SOPs, which that doesn't give anybody any more assurances, because guess what? If you give Veritas that that same opportunity, we know what their answer is going to be. Yeah, the, the, the SOPs have to be approved by the CRA, though. So it's a little bit different. It's, it's not quite a it's not just an internal document. It's a procedure that has to be approved at a state level before you're allowed to go through it in your lab. So we're saying SOP, but it's really a little bit more detailed than that. And that's, and that's the issue is that is it the SOP or is it truly an operations manual or an operations guide that now the state has the ability and the right to enforce? And I, 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 I guess I don't necessarily have a problem with the state looking over your shoulder to make sure that your testing procedures are correct. In theory and practice, that sounds like hell. Um, it's but, absolutely essential. Right. Because if it's it's the idea that it's I can trust me, I can't trust the other guy. Right. Yeah. But if you know that everybody's working with the same set of umpires, essentially, then there's going to be consistency in the game. Yeah. But do we, what we've seen from from Viridus, at least on an outsider's perspective, is that they've kind of run like that college frat guy that didn't have any consequence. Right. Ever since they got that lawsuit that gave them a 50 percent win. They've just been going a whole hog. I mean, look how they're elevating THC percentage right now. It's 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 obscene. So the fact is they didn't feel like they had that same level of scrutiny that Psy Labs has, right? I mean, leave to, tell me if I'm wrong. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, it's an interesting response to sort of the challenge against them. Um, you know, we, yeah, I think it's, as far as I understood it, all labs had to get their SOPs approved. And if they aren't approved, you're not supposed to be running them. Um, you know, and we've had historically issues come up before with MRA or CRA. And I get that they're, you know, learning to do enforcement as well, right? And so it's not, I can't expect them to be perfect at a new job either. Um, but I think that's where, you know, it, it ha there has been maybe some variations in how enforcement has played out over time that might need to be reevaluated. Um, and I think, yeah, it is it is really important for the state to look these things over um, in conjunction with the ISO people. So they're not, you know, they're they're trying to do the best they can to say, okay, here's an expert who looked at their science. Does this pass the smell test? Here's our scientists looking it over as well. Um, it just puts a lot more transparency and accountability behind the process. And I think it's for a reason. It's so that we can have these challenges. Now, you know, I mentioned this in the article. I'll, I'll say it again. You know, it'd be great if we had like a reference lab. Some states do have that. New York's going to put that in as part of their program. <laughs> you really do need a way to authenticate data one way or the other um, in situations like that. You know, if there's just sort of a he said, she said thing, and it's written in Michigan's rule that labs can be used to audit other samples and whatever. So it is, you know, statutorily allowed. Um, in, but I can see where it creates this uh, appearance of conflict of interest or something that can be used to try and undermine that process. And that's where having a, you know, an uninterested third party would be a really great uh, addition to something like this to be able to they're say just, they're just definitely push that that they're just trying to beat up on us when they they tried to recertify all those aspergillus labs that was our primary complaint that you can't trust the results of any of these labs because they're our direct competitor but that that independent third party you discussed would be an unimpeachable source because they wouldn't draw any revenue from the industry so they exactly. would have no no corporate connections to skew it for well yeah and that so, third party i was gonna say that third party is the is already a process that the state uses in evaluating other licensees. For instance, when doctors have a close call or a question and they have a complaint filed against them, the attorney general investigation will also include another doctor that is deferred to in terms of whether or not what the doctor did was reasonable. So you do have that expert. So it, to me, it sounds like part of the solution is having the state hire a handful of of uh, qualified lab experts that could run these tests as well. And you may have to have cannabis qualified people to do so, so that they can look over your shoulder. Because in my mind, you know, the lab operator isn't as afraid of just some, M you know, uh, MSP inspector as they would be as somebody who actually knows how the machine works and how the science is supposed to work. That is to say, being reviewed by your peer or your equal is much different than just being reviewed by a employee of the state. Uh, and that, that's, that's where science. the standard comes in. That's how real science works. You have to get peer reviewed. So, for example, yeah. the paper that we published, we, you know, our data is in it. Um, uh, you know, all I did is contribute data in a small section on our methods. I give all the credit to the writers, to the statistical analysis, and, and really tied that together. But um, that's the whole point. Is this past peer review? And so how we know that data is accurate is, well, we have 90,000 data points there to look at to put confines on this stuff. But that also matches up with scientific literature. So the times that people measured cannabis uh, THC content and weren't doing it for a company that was growing it or whatever, um, it came out a lot more like the data that you see from our lab and the labs that were vetted by this group that compiled our data. So they they already knew that you know lab, potency inflation and lab shopping was an issue. So if they wanted to write a real science paper that's got real scientific data, They'd have to actually do their due diligence on vetting the labs that seem to be putting forth the truth. Because there's all these statistical tests you can do that show when people are gaming a system. There's another great paper really recently that came out by a Harvard data scientist looking at uh, a statistical test of whether 20 percent potency is this like, is there really funny business going on at the 20 line? Right. Because a lot of people, if there's not a two in front of it, they can't sell it. You know, and so uh, there's other you know, um, industries where they've said, oh, here's a here's a, uh, a line that, you know, you do or don't want to cross. Can we test if anyone's screwing around? And they can see it. Well, they've applied this to states that have very closed systems like Nevada, where it's tough to get the data. They got it, but it was hard. 
and you can see it. there's anomalies at 20 percent you know a lot more frequency appears bunching up on right over the, the 20 line than appears below it um yet in a state like washington where it's been going on for a long time early uh th they've had their data more transparently available to the public since day one and labs were called out suspended fined um, and the biggest labs in the state that do the most testing are actually not showing anomalies. And as a result, most of their flower looks pretty legitimate out there, right? So they don't have a huge statewide problem. Not saying that m many states have this problem, though. You know, it's not uh, not unique to Michigan. Right on. Hey, I was so gonna say, can I, can, can I ask you a question, Jamie? Is, yeah. is, it, Lev, is, it, is it a problem that perhaps some of these labs or even some of the operators are using um, either outdated standards in terms of what they're testing with or outdated uh, outdated or slow machines as a, for instance, which I go back to in Michigan, we used to say that um, because we couldn't, there was no green leafy substance, any THC must have been synthetically created. And that was likely because we didn't have a, uh, a natural butter THC chart uh, to base our result, our current results against. So we had to call it um, synthetic because we were using outdated or, you know, let's say incomplete charts. Do you think that there's some aspect to that in the industry where it gets fuzzy around 20% because we're using, you know, we came from a, a 15 year old stand where everything maxed out at 18. No, I mean, you know, the concepts that go into how this stuff work are pretty universal, right? And these instruments that we use, they're, they're a lot like, yeah, you're going to occasionally run into a performance issue, right? If you're trying to do a really challenging measurement, find something very small in a high background, for example, you know, something that's very low abundance. Um, but it's like, they're, they're like instruments, you know? I mean, if, if, if Jimi Hendrix picks up an old guitar, you can still play it. It doesn't matter as long as it's got six strings and it's, uh, can plug in and isn't the you know isn't broken he can play it and it, he could also play the a twenty thousand dollar hundred thousand dollar guitar great you know it's it's really not about that um it's about the operator knowing whether the instrument works showing how that that you know that you proved that that works um there's a lot of great standards available right now some really reputable standards you know people who produce what are <laughs> certified reference materials these would be the actual standards in the sense of it's a small vial of solvent usually containing a single compound or a group of compounds at a very precisely and accurately known concentration they have accreditations and standards and procedures for when they screw up and documenting everything and so it really is this giant unbroken chain of um you know traceability that allows us to to find that bullseye right so it is it's it's an interesting concept in that you know, yeah, there we only know the absolute truth as well as we can sort of measure it there. But the beauty of science is that we can do that over and over again and actually put mathematical bounds on what's happening there and what those limits of sort of analytical error, you'd call it, or, you know, uncertainty in a lab are. And so that's a huge part of, you know, what every scientist is doing. That's part of method validation. Um, it's all that stuff you need to have there. So I don't think that we're outdated. I mean, you know, when you're seeing certain levels of, of uh, potency that just go far beyond and are big outliers, um, it's it's intentional, you know, or at least it's, uh, it's worthy of investigation. Yeah. Or it's something that's happening because you're, you know, um, it's, it's a problem because you don't know what's going on. But that's also, uh, you know, potentially unethical. Right. Like you have to sort of understand how the things you're doing work. Right. And you have a lot of room for that in spite of the fact that there's a third party. There's, you know, people get ISO certified. Oh, yeah. There's, there's processes. So, so there's a double checking on, you know, the, I guess, the calibrations or the processes or the, what, you know. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee every test is accurate every time, but it guarantees that you have a system to evaluate that and probe deeper into that and make determinations when there are questions. And if issues are found, you have a way to change them. Um, and fix them moving forward, you know? So for like, again, for us, if a flower test set uh, over 28% in our lab, we rerun it. I mean, we want to get a second data point to confirm that that's the case, uh, make sure there was no issues. So we're looking at those, you know, statistical extremes there to try and uh, make sure that we're accurate as much as possible. Right. Well, only 1.2% so, I mean, so of the cannabis exceeds that number. And that, that's a really yeah. small percentage. I'm sorry, Jamie, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying that Kirk, you know, Kirk wants to know there's, so there's a lot of room for, 
you know, once the lab is in motion, after submitting all the necessary information and demonstrating all the proper procedures and, and all that kind of stuff, there's still room for a lab that, that might want to push something one way or another to still do that, you know, after being in that position. You know, Lev talks about, you know, having a driver license or something like that. But you do have this third party. They, they are required. They're there. They double check stuff. That, that does happen. And then if there are weird anomalies, like you pass microbial tests every single time and even all the ones that had previously failed in a short amount of time and the THC is consistently way higher than everybody else and 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 that kind of stuff so that's that's how the that's how it's been double checked that's in real life how that it's worked to uh, have an investigation to see if somebody's really screwing around to that degree well yeah and that is the state's job more right so accreditation is there to sort of say you got your methods you're following them um, are you documenting nonconformities and, um, you know, are you keeping up with what you need to keep up to maintain the standard that we have accredited you for? Now, the state's job is to look through metric. They actually have that data, right? So they're the ones who sort of have to look at that and say, oh, is this, are there anomalies? You know, are there low numbers of fails, higher than average potencies compared to other people? So that really, you know, is on, on um, the state, you know, to look at that. I said the ISO people, they don't know. I mean, their job is not to come in and say, oh, you know, you tested a statistically anomalous amount of uh, cannabis over 30%. That's just beyond the scope of, of what they do. And that's why, you know, we choose to submit our data to a third party for scrutiny, for peer review, because again, I, <laughs> I'm a scientist and all I did when I was a scientist before this was present my data. I mean, you go out, you present it, you tell everyone exactly what you did, how you did it. And uh, the, the idea is that they can reproduce it and then build on that. And, and we learn more, uh, you know, that's how you expand the body of scientific knowledge of, uh, of humans. So I, I apply that same approach to cannabis because to me, the truth that we're ultimately going to kind of come to embrace is a lot more interesting and exciting than hyping up, you know, inflated, fake potencies and yeah <laughs> hey so um you know there there's uh there are some labs out there who just don't really want to get involved in the conversation really but uh, uh one lab did give me some information and and some things to consider and it's kind of confirming some stuff that we've already said it's kind of along the ideas of why these guys have stretched out their operations for so long where they believe that any other small lab or, you know, whatever, trying to make it that we're under this kind of scrutiny would have been, would have been just nailed a long time ago. And there's some frustration amidst, amongst some other labs, from what I understand on that concept, but they included, uh, I guess, sections or numbers nine through 13 of the complaint, which basically talks about a timeline of when the SOP was officially denied by the agency, when, um, uh, when they haven't been approved it just goes on and gets to other, you know, later dates and uh, multiple occasions of respondents, non-adherence with approved. So, you know, just, just lays it on all the issues, I guess, that they have in the complaint right there. And the point is uh, they believe that if, uh, if that description were about them, then they wouldn't have been in, they wouldn't have been able to operate for as long as they, uh, as long as Viridis has. Not that same level of scrutiny that the other labs go through. Exactly right. That's why they're yeah. acting so cowboy. Go ahead, Jamie. No, I just wanted to point out that's that confirms kind of what we were talking about and what other other perspectives out there. That's another lab. Again, they don't want to get involved in the conversation. But did you have another statement as well? Was there just one statement? Yeah, there's there's some other information that I got too, uh, such as you know there there is that scrutiny for everything over twenty eight percent. Uh, those audits. Maybe they should lower that number. Maybe lower and, that number to eighteen. Well, but here's then, well, really I mean, I, I mean, I, again, or, I mean, or we care about. I mean, I think we care about the number too much, personally. But but the point here, I didn't get to it yet, is that seventy eight percent of those audits come from Veritas. Yep. So, Only one one point two percent of all cannabis is above twenty eight percent, but seventy eight percent of that comes from one lab no. out of the 16 or 20 labs we got in the state. So go ahead, Chris, you're trying to get in. I see. Also just think about some of the fucking clowns that test with them and to, and to think that these guys are putting like 
consistently, you know, like, oh, like all we grow is 28% fire. Like, get the fuck out of here, man. You know, that's absolutely <laughs> insane to think about. So right or wrong, <laughs> these intense market forces demonstrate to people that if they throw the higher THC stuff out there, it will sell faster or get more, or, you know, whatever the those things are. And then they go shopping, as as Lev said in the MLive article and we that we, you know, know that we discussed. And you get that THC chasing, you know, throwing it around to different places, seeing who, throw, who gives you back a bigger number to go to the market with, you know. Lab shopping. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's retailers. Retailers are involved in that, too. Retailers want those numbers so they can sell those numbers because that's where the, unfortunately, the basic consumer market is. You know, I, I, I was. The market so they can just go down the street if they don't see what they want at your place. Yeah. Correct. Correct. You know, the, the only good thing that I think about with this complaint is that the complaint is. I don't want to say just kind of technical and thorough. And when you reference all of these, um, here are these rule violations and you violated this rule and you violated that rule. Uh, my encounters with LARA compliance or MRA, CRA now compliance has been, it went from like soft, kind of soft to kind of fuck you, we don't care. Um, and I was told that there was like, let's, I think it was like the first year or the first two years of the program, it was going to be like a, uh, advise and educate type of position on, on violations. Then even violations where it was like, oh, I didn't know, or I didn't know better, or I, 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 somebody else, like we've seen with the financial statements, there's a third party professional that had interfered somehow. Um, the state has moved towards, okay, too bad. If that's a yes, then we'll punish you for it. So in, in my mind, there are a lot of things that in the complaint, Veritas can't necessarily say no to they can fight and they might be able i don't want to say they'll be able to have to either challenge it and get rid of it because they're not going to be able to minimize it because i think they're going to what the state's looking for is a way to uh to ding them on any of those violations and the hope of repeated ones so they can ding them for either large amounts or let's say this might be the backdoor way of of uh the state saying well you lose a license this lab did it so you guys are gone um, let, let's be a lesson to your other license. And actually, if they're the same entity, it might affect the renewal process of the other license. So, you know, if, if you like to think of nefarious activity by the state, this might be where the, some of the good stuff happens. Jamie, you were, you mentioned previously uh, a potentially daily or a per instance fine situation. That's the impression I, I was under when I had a discussion. Yeah. About, you know, they knowingly be told this is not approved. So therefore, every instance of it potentially is finable. Sixty percent of the cannabis through the state—that's a lot so of. Instances. Tom, yes. Tom, reminding us that they likely got preferential treatment by that stupid board too. That, that original review board. Uh, Bailey was certainly was more was yeah. very favorite towards the law enforcement component and thought there should be more law enforcement people getting into the industry. So he he definitely shined a unfavorable light on that. I hate that guy. <laughs> how did how did we miss that too like when those guys were coming up for for a license like the 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 weed people you know what i mean like the the dirty cop thing you know like i got I, you know what i mean like I, I know people knew about it just uh i don't know oh that's crazy man well at that time they were just yeah. issuing licenses wiggly piggly and as you've seen i talked today uh, 403,000 plants last year 1.125 million plants under cultivation this year they just been issuing licenses because their interpretation, and maybe they're they're right, is that their their job is to just issue licenses. If everyone checks all the boxes, they don't get to say no. And I see you nodding your head or down there, Paul. So that that's, was by design. Yeah. That that was by design. And that's that's say that's the that's the other side of the coin of a low barrier to entry, right? When when mm -hmm. the state says if the city says okay, then we will issue the license. Now the state's like, well our job is just to issue the license. If you check all the boxes, um, the problem of that is, is that it's not like we're distributing all these licenses evenly and equally throughout the state, right? We're just funneling all these licenses and more or less in the same areas. And sometimes in the same people in the same companies in the same cooperative groups. So it's not like we're advancing um, different cannabis or other companies across the market as these licenses come up necessarily. And the ones that do come up, um, I don't want to say get washed out in a sea of oblivion, but it's, it's hard to compete. I mean, I've, I've even, 
I'm having clients calling me telling me they're, you know, putting things on hold for now until things turn around. And, you know, it's not that they're going out of business, it's just failing to start their business. So we might see, I don't know, a little bit more of that coming out. And we may not be at the bottom for pricing either. Hey, so it's it's after eight. I don't mind continuing this conversation. It's still good. And also, you know, um, we haven't really heard from some people here on this panel. We time to spin it around a little bit before we wrap it up as far as as far as I'm concerned, I really appreciate everybody being involved and being a part of this discussion and helping to get good information on record and uh, keep up on this story. You know, this is a weird one, man, as, as Chris was saying. But uh, Kyle, any? Uh... Yeah, well, first off, I just want to say thanks to Lee for all the good information. That was uh, I don't get that lab perspective every day, you know, so it's uh, good to get some real insight thank you joe oh yeah i appreciate you guys uh i think you know just wanted to say something about what paul said there i totally agree with you on that um well almost like frat boy or, or let's just call it immature mentality you know another way i think of it is it's an illicit market vestige right like when you're buying drugs in the illicit market you're like i, I got one guy i got one bag i'm getting most bang for my buck here kind of thing um it's just a different approach i think now the one of the amazing luxuries of regulated legal cannabis is that ability to take a step back from that and you know experiment with some different things you're not as familiar with try something that's lower thc and see if it's still uh pleasurable to you you know it's uh i think we need to move out of that mentality i mean so, so like the consumer education part of this is still is huge, and it's going to be part of what uh, you know, big piece of moving this forward. Or the, you know, you know the other. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. No, no. Oh, I was going to say the other part of bullshit of this whole uh, stinking scenario, if you will, is the same people, the same lobbying organizations who are supporting these folks, are the same ones who are trying to stuff safety and trying to strip our rights that we voted for as voters, those are the same people trying to pitch safety and bullshit to us, right? Which is, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. And I think the offensive nature that this has turned into over the last couple of weeks, the momentum that this conversation has gained and the, uh, I would say, media attention that I don't think we're, we haven't, we haven't seen it fully played out yet. I think now let's let this play out in the public. Let's let the public get a hold of this and let them form our, their opinion because they are the ones who voted this in. Right. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see the momentum that it's gaining. And the next step in this process does seem to be a hearing for Viridus in front of the cannabis regulatory agency in order to address the grievances that are aired against them. Uh, and after that hearing, uh, that's that's when we'll probably get judgments. And whether that's a public or private hearing, the fact that when the hearing is announced, that's also going to be newsworthy because people have been following this along, just like you mentioned, Anton. Hey, so real quick, uh, Avi from Steadfast said, it's more important than ever for consumers to protect themselves by learning which labs they can trust. Truth. And ask, her, well, ask before you make a purchase. Show that's, me the that's the... That's the biggest part of it, Jamie. You touched on something that I think is the biggest part. I believe, is it Lake Effect and, and Doja? I, it's Justin out there on the west side. Um, I don't believe they will buy product tested at Viridus. And when when you make that... They also of, don't discriminate against lower THC products that are still good. Right. Yeah, right. You should, you that, should. right. That type of economic uh, decision-making... It will force the market into a better place because if you you know getting a bad name and not carrying it is a lot different than just saying oh Viridus does bad stuff but look at all the products we carry because we're concerned about the bottom line so I hope we see more of that Great Lakes Holistics I believe that means GLH one more uh, in the same camp same philosophical approach which is appreciated. Yeah, I think the the buyers and uh, people who are stocking dispensaries have a huge role in this. Also, you know that's that's a great point. You were talking about 
you trust your wine shop guy, you trust your mechanic, whoever, you know, you shop at Whole Foods because you know that they did their due diligence on the products they're putting out there to say that meets a certain ethical or quality standard, right? So um, you mentioned diamonds. That's another great one where there's shadiness going on in the diamond testing industry. And, you know, depending on what lab tested, um, your grade on your diamond can vary. And, and uh, so it is important to know, you know, as a consumer, uh, have the ability to do some research on kind of the, the deeper layers of what you're consuming um, and just vetting those people who are the buyers, that kind of that person who's in between you, you and the products and the producers, you know, so yeah, educating the consumers, educating the buyers, um, educating the growers, you know, making sure they realize like, hey, your your 25% weed is quite potent. You're quite uh, high in THC, let's call it, you know, it's, uh, it's up there. And so I think just reminding them that there's a realistic scale they should be mapping to, um, I think is important. And once everyone kind of embraces this, you know, it's going to take the industry in a better direction. Right. Jocelyn says Baker Curtis doesn't buy Beardus tested product, and uh, of course Danielle at Stone Depot. The most also, often Danielle, yes. Yeah, also does not uh, go there with that undesirable product. And I've heard people discuss how it's known that that image is pretty negative. And well, can you imagine if your if your entire persona in the industry was based around your high THC products, and then an action from the CRA? requires that lab to use everybody else's SOPs and all of a sudden your your you know 36s are turning into just an average run of the mill 27s and now all of a sudden you are identity less you have you've you've trained people to buy on high THC now you've taken high THC away from them now they don't care who you are they they might have been buying your stuff for years but once you're down to that 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 ugh, THC level then they've lost you and then let's slap a remediation label on there as well and then see where we get. Yes. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. So, then you're going to change your name and try it all over again. <laughs> well, Green Peak switching to Sky Mint is a perfect example of that. Trying to scrub the image by rebranding, which is not uncommon in any industry. But here in the cannabis industry, we're a more sophisticated buying public. And, and we don't forget the people on the screen, the people here who have all been involved for years or who may have only been involved for a couple of years who are committed because we're passionate about this. We will always remember the assholes and we'll never let them get away with it. Never. Look how look, Michaud's offense was years ago and we're still hounding him over it, right? You cannot be a bad person to the consumer in this industry and get the fuck away from it. You can't. We, we punish you. That's what we do. It's called policing the industry. So uh, Trish, anything you want to make sure that we get in? That you get in before we uh, start winding down. Trish, you're on, on mute, although you're in the coolest location of all of us, I think. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, no, I actually am just like stopping everything here right now. And, uh, the only thing I can say is that maybe for the next show, I can tell you about what the virus guy said to us that I have a bet. Okay. But. We'll talk about that later. Oh, a cliffhanger. Yeah. Cliffhanger for Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We got a phone for Tuesday. We can bring them on too when we need to. Uh, thank you. Thanks yeah. for being on with us. Yeah, other than that, no, like, I'm just learning all kinds of new stuff. I, I'm very interested to, to see where this is all going. Uh, everything that I had a question for is pretty, pretty much answered. Um, you know, just getting into the thought of understanding testing and I just, my mindset is like just being it as a consumer, you know, who, who makes the, 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 the determines at the end of that all, what the standards are, you know, and as you can see in a lot of spaces and places right now, there are lawmakers and institutions that actually do the work for them. We're seeing a lot of confusion in that too. So just kind of an adventure. I feel like it will, I'm just kind of curious how long it actually took for any product to have a standard. Like, did it take a couple years, 10 years, 20 years? Like, how long is that? Just curious to see what that will look like. Okay, go cool, get yeah. Sorry, my dad's mad right now. So we're not quite there yet, apparently. And uh, but we should. Chris, is there anything you want to make sure you get in? 
Uh, just adject hate for Viridis, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, it, I, I wonder if, like, if uh, now that it's becoming more of like a, a mainstream media thing, people know about it. If, uh, if people, because I, I assume there's some people that are just using Viridis because they're just like, hey, these guys are propping up THC. Like, if I don't do this, like, uh, you know, it's like prisoner's dilemma. Like, I'm, if I feel forced right? to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm wondering if some of those people. Are, are now at this point like oh shit this is obviously going to turn out really bad i'm going to be on like a destroy list you know what i mean like uh, i'm wondering if, if people i'm going to end up on chad watch yeah yeah <laughs> they're like ah shit definitely getting made fun of well, them watch, kind of like, going down as as could be the result of this right i mean yeah so i, I wonder if we're going to see like that be- market share that they have on testing pivot to to the other labs and stuff as people are like hey we should probably just go ahead and go to a real lab. It's not run by dirty cops, you know? We just saw a list of four, four dispensary chains that are not carrying stuff tested by Viridis. So you know they're feeling the, the effect. Amy, what's the, what's the name of your lab? So you post the name of your lab up here too? He is ABCO Labs, uh, A-B-K-O Labs out of Oakland County. Okay. Sorry, I think she's out of Macomb County. I think she's out of Warren. The Warren, I believe, yes. Yep. How about uh, anybody else have anything else they wanted to uh, to add as we kind of wind the subject down? As we said, so they can be on display there because she's offering um, tour of their lab. Right. Look at what a, a proper lab looks like. Sure. Well, it's transparency. Nothing to hide. That's what you want. I agree. I think one of the things we've learned today uh, after listening to all the experts and actually reading the comments and responding to them is that uh, there's a lot of hope people have in the in the cannabis industry. We want labs to be reliable. There's so many reliable, good testing labs out there that this is a proof statement for the one bad apple spoils the bunch kind of a theory. And I think what we also want is to see a CRA that has some teeth, that's not afraid to actually take a bite out of somebody who's demonstrably not doing things that they're told. The Viridis method has been denied by the CRA for months, and they're continuing to use that. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, potentially a daily ding uh, or a, a per use ding, but certainly uh, some kind of a sanction. And in order to restore respect, they got to slap them. I mean, I, at this particular point, they've really just walked around with their finger in the face of the CRA, and that needs to stop. Otherwise, as we go forward into 2023, 24, 25, our state program is not going to be very well respected. And frankly, uh, this is going to be a time of great change federally and regionally from the Midwest as well, too. We need to be a leader and we don't need to be a laughing stock. This is how you restore respect on the part of the CRA by taking care of business uh, with all of the offenses that you've already outlined in this document against Veritas. Yeah. I mean, certainly they they have room. The state has room for improvement. I kind of think that they as that bureaucratic like department that handles this issue, they respond to stuff that happens to them and they, then they kind of shore it up for next time around. That's part of like their process and what they do. And I know that they're making some changes and they've learned things, you know, based on this case. But, but this was, in my opinion, it was kind of like these, these unethical schmoes who have a, uh, you know, a pattern of pulling shit like this, you know, and pose this on them. So I know the state does, you know, does deserve some scrutiny from a couple different angles, and I I agree. But I mean, to think that somebody would really try to like, you know, do something this bold of this magnitude, man, is just, you know, I don't think that was expected. Maybe, you know. Every scientist we talk to says this is outside the norm for scientific behavior. This is outside the norm for the way things normally operate. Uh, and you know, after that, after the court case last year, where the judge kind of split the baby and, you know, uh, released Bay City's Veritas samples from uh, from hold. I mean, it's it's been a different ballgame there. And as we've talked about and, and pointed out in several different instances, it does seem as if Veritas has been under different scrutiny than the remainder of the labs in the state during that time period. So, you know, Rick, the, the thing that, that strikes me, too, that you what you what you're talking about is that um, it's not like we can attribute ignorance Veritas, right? We can't write off that like, oh, hey, you're brand new. You didn't know. You, you, you're, you're mom and pop. You're too small. You have some of these things. It's like, no, you came in with 
not just experience, but like the best kind of experience. Like he used to test drugs for a living for the government. Like that to me, now we cannot attribute ignorance. We can attribute malice because there can be no other way of looking at it because if, that. If that type of experience for what they're doing, they're not going to be that. F- Oh, it looks like he's saying fuck. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, though, those guys were shitty at running the state lab, too, though. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> But the fact is, though, as I mentioned in that timeline that we talked about, uh, 2019 on, uh, they, they were in trouble with the, M- C- the MRA almost immediately. Joe Sullivan asked a question earlier about he had tested with Viridis and Bay City. And it's true that they didn't develop this new Viridis method of, of enhanced THC potency. Leave. what's the correct phrase? Inflation? Uh, THC inflation? Is that it? That's what I call it. I like to call it potency puffing too, you know, puff it Whoa, up. Oh, that's a little risque, but okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So THC inflation and the, uh, uh, the, you know, maybe they were testing your, or you were testing with them at a time before they developed this extremely high uh, THC method. Poor Paul is still frozen down there. He looks painful. <laughs> You know, something you mentioned about um, (laughs) Michigan needing to do something, you know, um, they also go around a lot touting themselves as the model for cannabis regulation, you know. And so to me, um, that's a big claim. And if you're uh, unable to to regulate, you know, um, can you really make a claim like that? And, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops. That's just now a public trust issue. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rick. No, you, you finish up because I was going to try and end the show here. So go ahead. And oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say now Now we've gone into public trust issue territory. And that seems to be when a lot of shit gets handled in our society. So hopefully real change is coming. Well, I hate it when the courts are the ones that are arbiters of what's right and what's wrong. I think it's it's pretty clear from the evidence presented that there's evidence of wrongdoing and sanction of some kind is necessary. Jamie, what do you, what do you got? Uh, I'm just really happy that we were able to offer up some good information, bring people up to date on this. This is something we've been following for a lot. And a lot of us have been very skeptical and critical of this group before this scandal ever took place. And so we'll continue to, uh, you know, to be here to have these discussions and make sure everybody's up to date on this. And I appreciate uh, Lev. We've called you Lev, Lave, and Leave so far tonight. Hopefully one of those is correct. Yeah, technically, Lev lives more of like a Hebrew pronunciation of it, but um, it's actually also technically correct then in that way too. So, I'm not my, gonna... my, my nephew's middle name is is Lev L E V, and that's why yeah, I said yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's more the Israeli pronunciation. It means heart in Hebrew. All right. Oh, that's cool. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, Paul, really appreciate Paul coming on. Uh, Trish. Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll see you on Tuesday so we can uh, continue the discussion. And thanks a lot for kind of co-hosting with us tonight, too, um, Chris and Kyle. Absolutely, man. And Chad good. Watch, of course, you know, every other week, uh, Tuesdays at 1. Yep, and they talk about all we're the gonna be talking about We're going to be talking about real estate, Chad, soon. <laughs> there are some out there expanding out a little bit which is yeah. a lot of the people that are doing the thc shit it's it's those you know it's those folks i feel i suspect a lot of them are just cooking the revenue for a little bit longer till they can sell you know yeah right and of course anton thanks for joining us too man always pleasure i love you guys uh, anybody else want to wrap up rick anything to Again, I it, I just would like to say, oh, wow, what an amazing group of people we had in our chat room tonight. I mean, we've, we've called attention to all the wonderful folks we have here, but I mean, we had Tom Beller, uh, Captain Kirk was in there, uh, Amy Brown, uh, several people from the labs. Jamie was getting texts from people who were watching. Danielle, uh, Ryan, yeah. It, it, Danielle, all of these, Joe. these fantastic folks. Yes, Amy. exactly. Yep. I'm, tons I'm, and tons of people. Like they, Jocelyn can't, name came in. Yep. can't name them all. But that's the very much appreciated. Yeah, the people that you know are interested in this this kind of stuff and have now amidst us, we've yeah. we've learned more about what's going on, a little bit more up to date. That was the point. So Marie Watts too. It. Sure, yeah. There's just a ton of folks that tuned in, and, and I and I really yeah. want to appreciate them. Uh, it's kind of a who's who of, of the people that are active. I think a lot of uh, 
of the decisions and in the organizations as well. Brandy Zink and some of the others too. Yeah, Jennifer, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So thanks very much. And a lot of good questions too that, that were part of the conversation tonight, which is always kind of cool to have that resource. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks to everybody who was on, and uh, we'll all, we'll be back Tuesday. Cover this a little bit again. See you guys.